Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Nelly Deutsch. It's not Vance or Joseph. Hello, Vance, and welcome. Welcome to uh, the last day, the third day of connecting online. And there we've got our two speakers up. Hello. Just a little reminder that Connecting Online is an annual event in February. It is well sought after. In fact, a lot of professors, by the way, I got some emails, are asking their students to join. Some of them are even requiring them to join Connecting Online. So uh, that's, that's wonderful to hear. The presenters should be very proud that their presentations are worthy of the academia. So that's uh, really, really exciting. Um, the presenters are from around the globe, from South America, North America, Europe, Asia, Africa. We've got the whole globe, including Australia. So it's really, really wonderful. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you as one of the presenters next year. This presentation, I don't want to talk too much here, uh, is going to be very, very special. We've got two presenters, uh, Van Stevens and Dr. Joseph Colpert, who's a well-known expert from uh, Belgium. So it really is, I think, the first time that I've had the honor of uh, moderating a session from uh, a presenter in Belgium. So uh, I'm really excited about that and about learning. So let's connect for learning. And I'll mute my mic and I'll be using a pink color for those of you that are shocked that this is Nelly speaking as Vance okay so I'm going to be writing in pink thank you maybe I could just introduce thank you, you thank you. can you hear me go ahead Anyway, I was just going to say that this is, I don't want to take time from what is really Joseph's presentation, but it kind of got organized through a, a concatenation of different events. For all, this is a regular learning together event. We do these every Sunday at about this time. And we are blending with EVO, Electric Village Online. I'm co-moderating moderating session called MOOC, which is a session about MOOCs. And EVO is a sort of a MOOC. Um, Nelly certainly has reached MOOC status with her session in EVO. So in any event, without much further ado, we have found that uh, this presentation, this event uh, for the participants in the MOOC course and also for learning together, this happens to go very nicely with the Connecting Online conference, which Nelly convenes every year. And this time it's from February 7th through the 9th. This is the last day of the conference. I believe we're the third presentation for today. So, Joseph, thank you very much for coming to join us here. We really appreciate it. We might be seeing some lag. Thank you so much. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you for being there. I see the list of attendees is growing all the time. I was a little bit afraid that I would be alone with Vance, not afraid. I would be, would have been interesting as well. We have so many things to talk about. Now, the title for this afternoon is a little, perhaps might frighten you a little bit, Research Challenges and Core Epistemological Considerations. But I really think uh, that it would be interesting for uh, people and colleagues uh, not familiar with the car world as well. Um, computer assisted language learning and people working in technology, some area of education. Uh, I will try to make it as relevant and um, interesting as possible. Now, I have given a similar talk at World Car in um, Glasgow last, I guess it was June or July last year, and that was based on, let's say, on the one hand, uh, 30 years of experience in the car field as a researcher, developer, language teacher, editor of the Call Journal, etc. But also, after having read, after having read um, uh, doctoral thesis, the books on Call and all the articles, uh, I have tried to make a summary, but I have to admit, it's uh, very personal 
uh, angular photonic and vision on what should be done in the current field in terms of research. Now, what I'm trying to do is I have presented as a program. I continue to talk about it, and I will continue to use this as a theme of a her own call conference in Antwerp by this year. I will come back to that conference uh, at the end. Um, to a uh, real focus on epistemological challenges. And then at Eurocall uh, in August this year, I hope we can continue in this research to let those, the things I had defined as a starting point to discuss those and get come to a kind of an agreement among researchers and see uh, and guide and show direction to our younger researchers in car. Now, um, let's go to the um, first point, thank you. Um, when I was working on this and trying to summarize all the challenges I saw, and I knew I had to limit the number of these challenges, I could not get lower than 12. Uh, so I immediately thought about the 12 uh, labels of Hercules and found, found this image on, on, on the web somewhere. Um, well, I'm going to quickly illustrate every challenge, and I hope I will not need more than 30 minutes to do that. And then uh, Hans, uh, Stevens will uh, ask some questions, and hopefully you will also add uh, intervening meeting. Um, well, maybe I could just introduce you, Joseph. Good. Yes? Can you hear me? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Well, anyway, I was just going to say that this is, I don't want to take time from which is really Joseph's presentation, but it kind of got organized through a concatenation of different events. Of all, this is a regular learning together event. We do these every Sunday at about this time. And we are blending with EVO, Electric Village Online. I'm co-moderating moderating a session called MOOC, which is a session about MOOCs. And EVO is a sort of a MOOC. Uh, Nellie certainly has reached MOOC status with her session in EVO. So in any event, without much further ado, we have found that uh, this presentation, this event uh, for the participants in the MultiMOOC course and also for learning together just happens to go very nicely with the Connecting Online conference, which Nellie convenes every year. And this time it's from February 7th to the 9th. This is the last day of the conference. And I believe we're the third presentation for today. So Joseph, thank you very much for coming to Join us here. We really appreciate it. We might be getting some lag. Thank you so much. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, thank you for being there. I see the list of attendees is growing all the time. I was a little bit afraid that I would be alone with Vance. Not afraid. I would be would have been interesting as well. We have so many things to talk about. Now, the title for this afternoon is a little perhaps might frighten you a little bit. Research challenges in call epistemological considerations. But I really think uh, that it would be interesting for uh, people and colleagues uh, not familiar with the call world as well. Um, computer assisted language learning and people working in technology, some area of education, uh, I will try to make it as relevant and um, interesting as possible. Now, I have given a similar talk at World Call in uh, Glasgow last, I guess it was June or July last year, and that was based on, let's say, on the one hand, uh, 30 years of experience in the call field as a researcher, developer, language teacher, editor of the call journal, etc. But also, after having read, after having read um, uh, doctoral thesis, the books on call, and all the articles, uh, I have tried to make a summary. But I have to admit, it's a very personal uh, angle of attack and vision on what should be done in the call field in terms of research. Now, what I'm trying to do 
is I have presented this at WorldCon. I continue to talk about it, and I will continue to use this as a theme of our own call conference in Antwerp by this year. I will come back to that conference uh, at the end um, to really focus on epistemological challenges. And then at Eurocall uh, in August this year, I hope we can continue amongst researchers to let those, the things I have defined as a starting point, to discuss those and get come to a kind of an agreement among researchers and see uh, and guide and show direction to our younger researchers in CAL. Now, um, let's go to the um, first thing, thank you. Um, when I was working on this and trying to summarize all the challenges I saw, and I knew I had to limit the number of these challenges, I could not get lower than 12. Uh, so I immediately thought about the 12 uh, labors of Hercules and found, found this image on, on, on the web somewhere. Um, well, I'm going to quickly illustrate every challenge, and I hope I will not need more than 30 minutes to do that. And then uh, Vance uh, Stevens will uh, ask some questions, and hopefully you will also add, uh, intervene when needed. Um, next slide. Okay. Once defined that I had 12 labors, um, I had I have quickly seen that there are three kinds of challenges. And that was beautiful to see. I had four contextual challenges. I hope you can read those. Uh, I had four methodological challenges and four epistemological challenges. Now, at our goal, uh, our call conference in Antwerp, our keynote speakers will focus on contextual challenges, logical challenges, and in the group discussions, we will focus on these epistemological challenges. Okay, let's have a quick look now at what I see as the main challenges in the field of, let's say, technology and learning in general. Why not? Or technology and language learning more specifically. And my first challenge is huge, is academic meritocracy. I have written a um, editorial on the subject, which has a thousand and twelve. You have the reference uh, at the bottom of the screen. Well, I see many colleagues fighting uh, against well, uh, academic evaluation, which, in my view, has nothing to do with epistemological contribution, meaning building knowledge. We need more knowledge in the call field. And if we focus, and if we are unable to focus on something else, then our points for our own promotion, our uh, CV, etc., then this is counterproductive. So the current academic evaluation system is incomplete, unjustified, unfair, demotivating, counterproductive, and perverse. And I'm not the only one to state that. And I, as an older researcher, let's say, I can allow, I can afford to do so, and hope I uh, relieve the, pre the pressure a little bit on our younger researcher, where I try to convince them to find the balance between what uh, their superiors tell them to and what they feel they should do. Um, the worst thing is that 20 years ago, we were all good colleagues, but within the same institution, good colleagues become career-threatening competitors. So, this is my call for fighting academic meritocracy everywhere in the world, and to say, listen, this is not our problem. The, 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 the boards of the university and the leaders of the university should not pressure us with their problem. Our problem is um, to contribute to the field and to help our colleagues. Okay. Second, um, very quickly here, I skipped something like 10 slides. My second challenge is the academic value of call activities. Now, uh, if you say I'm into call, uh, then 
you might have the impression that your colleagues are not really valuing your work as much as they would do with other disciplines. And in my view, this is because uh, we are facing uh, problems like the fact that language education is, is being dismantled in higher education all over the world. That call is a fact, not enough knowledge is available. It's a multidisciplinary field. We have to deal with real world aspects. We cannot isolate ourselves in a laboratory. It's engineering, it's very slow, everything with just one research activity. Um, citation index impact factor, very difficult for us. Technology evolves too quickly. I always write, try to write the course on educational technology, and once I finish my first chat, I'm already out of date. Um, then the, there's a lack of dedicated research method. We organized a conference on the topic, but I still believe that uh, we can't just apply experimental research methods in, in, in the COVID. I'll come back to that later. Um, this is the academic value or the perception of its value in, uh, in the academic field. But this is a little bit situated within a broader perception of call within so many myths and hypes. And I often really get angry with uh, the fact that many people still believe that technology has an effect on our brain, that technology has an effect, direct effect on learning. And in most presentations I give, the sentence is, technology has no direct, measurable, and generalizable effects on learning. The effect comes from the entire learning environment. And the role of technology is to create, to contribute to create this powerful learning environment. What I see is that uh, you have three groups, two or four groups of, you have people who do know, don't know anything about education and technology who want to jump on the bandwagon uh, and pretend to know something about it. And then you have callers, even call people who do not uh, care or do not bother about, let's say, some blurred ontologies, like um, what I read about digital natives, di digital pedagogy, games, blended learning, or flipped classrooms. There are all examples, these terms, of persuasive language use. Um, they are not wrong, but we use them, the definition in which we use them, they all convey some pressure. Uh, the policy says we should do blended learning, so teachers think they should indeed use some technology. So they implement technology somewhere, and then they say, oh, I'm cool, I'm okay, so I'm into blended learning. So that's my problem. I'm currently writing, writing an editorial about uh, blurred ontologies, so you, you, you can expect that within a month or so. Uh, my friend Spitzer wrote a book, Dementia Digital. The too frequent use of digital reduces the mental capacity of our children. Well, I don't, we don't have to believe that, and I'm still not, not sure what to think about that. I have to reread the book, but it makes us uh, think about uh, what is now true about technology, what has been proven about technology, we don't know yet, and there are so many people um, uh, uh, launching some false image about particular technology, uh, playing with well, people that easy believe uh, the new myths and hypes with which they can make themselves interested. That's more broad public, and this is my fourth challenge. Well, you have academic meritocracy that's within the university, academic value of call that is worldwide within academia, myths and hypes, uh, often policy makers, etc. But the broad public perception, that's even worse. And I don't know. That's a little bit the way I see it, but I see we have a very international audience today, and I would simply, I'm still simply waiting your reaction uh, to see whether your impression is the same. Meaning that, uh, go to the next slide, that people is, believe more easily uh, a reassuring lie than the inconvenient truth. And my message is certainly an inconvenient truth, meaning technology does have an effect on learning in the entire learning environment, and technology contributes 
the, with the effects of the burning environment. Um, it's very difficult to accept that, and it's because you to design your learning environment. So for teachers, it's not really uh, an, an easy task uh, to do and to uh, do. Now, waiting for the next slide. Okay, there we go. Um, when people start talking about language learning and technology, and uh, learning reception, uh, or uh, they start simply about learning in general, language learning, then I ask them, what is the usefulness of an open heart characterization in case of a heart attack? And then they say, so what will I know? Then I say, yeah, uh, language learning is even more difficult and sophisticated than that. So that's a sentence you can always use just to show that it works in the United States. You have an easy and quick opinion about language learning in general. Uh, you can balance them uh, this way. Um, this is a little bit slow. Another sentence I often use is, uh, no, someone else used, is don't bear my mother working call. She thinks I'm a piano player in a bordello. That's a little bit exaggerated, perhaps, which says something about the underestimation of the complexity of natural language and language learning. Um, and the affordances of technology are generally overestimated by people. So people come and tell me, uh, they hear, hear something about technology, language learning. Ah, did you know about this technology? It seems there's a smartphone and that will translate automatically everything you will say, finish from, finish to, to, to whatever, uh, Portuguese, etc. And people, people still easily believe that even after all the stories we have seen in the past, with overestimation. Now, very funny, uh, I'm not going to show this now, but you can easily find both um, movies on on the internet. Is the pomegranate phone versus Google Glasses. And the pomegranate phone is a fun movie because it's a smartphone that uh, that you can use as a shiver, uh, that you can use as an automatic translator, as a coffee maker, etc. And I always show it to people and it's amazing to see how well people believe what they are actually saying in that movie. While when I show the Google Glasses movie, people are actually it no, will never be possible. Technology in there, it only depends on the information that should be available in several minutes. So let's advance very quickly. Um, the four methodological uh, challenges I have, and the first challenge is uh, design. Um, I, I believe that design is neglected uh, as a research method, also as an activity uh, in, in the call field. Not only design of technology, but also design of learning environments and uh, research design. Um, in the, on the level of research design, there's a, a beautiful evolution. If you look at the early articles in, in, in Calico, Recall, whatever, about where, where, where people say, well, I tried to use this technology with my students, and they just loved it. And the articles we get now deal more with complex alpha model analysis, actually question modeling, and, and principal component analysis than in linguistics, technology, or pedagogy. Now, there's this dogmatic approach that you should only use research methods described in Cohen and Mannion. But what I see, if you try to do that, you, you have this, you're confronted with the no significant difference syndrome. You will never be able to show the significant difference, uh, meaning uh, a general, uh, generalizable effect. Okay, I'm going to skip this very quickly, just showing you, if you're interested, just come to call conference. The second one is replication. It's very easy. When I say, well, perhaps you might prove that the wiki works with your students, or another technology works in a very specific situation. 
Well, the only thing we, 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 get, we have have to do it. it's very easy we just have to replicate it that's the problem uh, try to do the same thing in different uh, circumstances because if you measure anything it depends on local factors if you measure anything it's in terms of probabilities if we measure anything what we measure depends on the designness of the learning environment and with the designness I mean the the extent to which learning environment has been designed in a methodological and systematical way. Replication is very important, so that replicate research should also be unpublishable. So people, young researchers are often very, uh, afraid to do that because uh, they think my research should be original. Our point is, and I think many editors agree on this in the call field, no, we should focus on replication because this is very important. What works in the United States does not necessarily work in Japan, but there might be things that are generalizable. So this is really a huge, that's another very important topic, slow research. Uh, this has to do with academic meritocracy, of course, the pressure on us to publish very quickly, we say, and I also say, look at my CV, I will not publish the number of articles they want. I will publish whenever I am ready with something that I can say, I will distribute that, I will let people know and ask them what they think about it. We need replication, we need long-term research goals, we need specialization, internalization, identification, networking, slow thinking and tra transdisciplinarity. And this is perhaps a very difficult uh, term to uh, understand. Um, but transdisciplinarity, we all know that call is a multidisciplinary field, that's the problem. Interdisciplinarity is, might be considered a solution, but in my view it's still a challenge. Because um, when you work in an interdisciplinary team, you every member of the team is still working within his or her own discipline and reasoning and methods and concepts. So it always remains difficult to communicate with people from other disciplines. Now, it's very beautiful, and you should look at that document by Nicolescu. Well, it's very beautiful, and it's also my experience that a, a, a better way to collaborate, let's say, among pedagogues, technolog technological people, um, um, developers, etc., is the elaboration of unity's knowledge beyond disciplines based on moderation, mediation, association, and transfer. That means uh, that um, a linguist and pedagogues and developers can talk about the same thing if they together build new concepts. So that's new for everyone in the team. And that's an excellent way of communicating. Once you define the concept you're working on, in an ontological way, in a detailed way, and avoid the blur that we just talked about. We have to talk about the same thing. But if we, among disciplines, all talk about other things, new things that we build together, that's a very beautiful way to work together. Okay. Okay. Let's now skip to, go on to the last category, epistemological challenges. And that is me saying, epistemological challenges means what knowledge, which knowledge do we need most in order to make the field of educational technology in general or the culture or specifically advance more. And my first, the first challenge, epistemological challenge is again, blurred ontology or not open means we all talk about books, open educational resources, massive open resources. And what I see is, uh, uh, it's not people. Let's look at the word. <clears throat> if you look at open source, what was the success of open source that built operating systems like Linux, uh, Android, the open approach built Wikipedia, meaning 
that you you use something built by someone else, you add to that, you improve the quality, and you share it again. That's the surreal spirit of open source. And recent phenomena like open data and open knowledge really go in direction. They force the government and large institutions to share data so that, that it can be improved and shared again. Now, what I see in open educational resources, and worse even in MOOCs, in the case of MOOCs, I really do not see the real significance of the word open because it just means I can go to Stanford online and, and follow a course. And if I cannot change content in the course as a teacher and contribute to that course and share it and distribute it again, that's not really open. What I see with open educational resources is again, and I talked about that in a, in the Bologna, Europe or Bologna SIG, is that I see four challenges with open educational resources on one hand. This really should be an absolute priority in education. Teachers who have 50% less work and 200% results if they use open educational resources. And my meaning, using each other's material, improving it and sharing it again. That was possible with Linux, Android, etc. Why is that not possible with a good French course? No, the only thing that works is as an institution, you can share it, you can use it. Okay, that's an important rule. But if I think about education worldwide, and the main problem is the development of content, of learning content, that's the main challenge worldwide. If I then say that teachers can considerably reduce their work and have more results, at the same time, I say, title of my Calico uh, presentation, Open Educational Resources, why it should and why it won't work. It's an absolute necessity. And at the same time, I say it won't work. Why? Well, I see four challenges. The first one is conceptual, meaning, ha, we do not even agree on what the word open means. It's a blurred ontology. Technological, we do not know which technologies will allow us to do so. Problems, well, less of my concern, we have creative commons nowadays, etc. But my main concern is psychological. And this is what we currently now here around as well with my students, we are analyzing. How is it possible that teachers refuse to use or to work in a way that would reduce work and give them more results? And we are, we have already identified two, three strong uh, psychological factors that prevent them from uh, doing so, and we certainly continue that in the direction. So that's first epistemological challenge. Does mean we absolutely need open resources, educational resources, but we need more knowledge in order to make that succeed. So, the first point is more research on openness. Okay, almost there. Um, the next one, oh yeah, there's a, just, there has been just a special issue of the College Journal of Educational Resources by Michael Thomas. Um, very interesting to mention that. <coughs> okay. Then this, the second one, well, I, I already said a little bit, the major challenge in my view is psychological. The problem is not technology. I've been programming and developing programs for more than 20 years after been, having been a language teacher in secondary education for six years. And I can say, no, no, technology is very easy. Technology is no problem at all. The main problem is in programming and developing is reasoning, that's all. But the main problem in making, making and designing good programs is psychological. And I'm glad to see that in uh, theoretical research lately, uh, much attention goes to the psychological aspect of motivation. It's certainly very important, and I certainly recommend the following approach, which is the me and the show put us into self uh, very, very important model to see how we, with our technology, we can, we can visualize the roadmap to the ideal self. So, if we succeed doing so, then 
that would enhance determination. Self determination theory by Darcy and uh, based on the three innate psychological needs, uh, competence, relatedness, autonomy, but more importantly, they have this motivation scale, which is not really binary, like saying someone has an internal or external motivation. No, they have six motiv uh, motivation scales so that you can put your attention on this scale and, and then go and measure from there if there is any improvement. The technology acceptance model is more and more referred to as a way of, of reflecting uh, what users expect from, from uh, a system, expected ease of use, expected usefulness, etc. And also, uh, the, the later model based on that is the unified theory of ethics and use of technology. I certainly recommend that to read. And, well, let's say, I'm also proud to say that I have my own approach, which is somewhere in between, but it's, it's, it's an approach uh, for knowing what we should focus on while designing systems for learning. And it's the personal goal theory. Uh, it was elicitation of uh, personal goals as design concept, and it has been published in Innovation in Language Learning and Teaching. Now, more importantly, what are the challenges? The challenge for design and psychological point of view is that you cannot design for individuals. You can de de design for well, uh, groups or subgroups. Your, your mic is not Do you wish to design for the entire world? Fantastic. That will be difficult. It's really so the, the problem is, which common denominator can you try to find for, for the psychological factors you have to deal with. And in my view, if you read my article, on your computer, my, my point is that uh, most of the things that play, that? the factors that hinder or stimulate the learning process, uh, are all subconscious. And the most difficult thing is to elicit uh, these no, subconscious factors wonderful. and to no, know uh, what plays in properly. what you play in your Sorry. design. I conduct focus groups every week all over the world in place in different circumstances just to know uh, or to learn how to improve that technique. So my point is, let's stop talking about learner needs when designing. Yes, those needs are important, but you, we should dig deeper. And my experience is the, the deeper we dig and the more we focus on subconscious goals, the more effect this has on design. Okay, almost there, one minute uh, for two the, uh, After open, psych uh, psychological, the, the uh, almost last point is smart. We, we all knew the, 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 the time of uh, intelligence, and in the phase, in, in that time, intelligence, you try, I'm guilty, I also try to build intelligence routines, and an intelligence routine is trying to find something in the answer of a student, uh, and try to give some intelligent feedback, knowing what the problem of a student is. But those routines did not necessarily know something about the student, the learner, nor about the context in which the learner uh, finds his or herself. So the work by Heeft and Schulze certainly are uh, things we have to refer to and continue to build upon. But this, we should see this now, the same work, within the context of ambient intelligence and augmented reality. Well, I think that now, Central technology allows us to know where the learner is. This is what we call the contextualization of the learner process. Uh, if I am somewhere in Italy and it's my smartphone knows I'm learning Italian on level B2 and it's almost noon, I am hungry, then the system might look up a, rest a nice pizzeria in my neighborhood if it knows what my budget is and say it's almost noon and automatically uh, show me the menu of the day in Italian with the translation. This is technologically speaking possible. We are currently working on prototypes like that. So that means that next to face-to-face -face education, distance education and all related tools, we can offer a third dimension to learning. And uh, this third dimension is simply tools that try to extract from the surrounding learn? reality things that are useful for me as a language learner. This is contextualized learning. On the other hand, if you combine that with knowing more about the learner, about the personalization, if the system knows I'm a learner of Italian on level two and I'm this or that, then contextualization and personalization may enrich the learning process. And the beautiful thing is, again, technologically speaking, very easy to do very easy to do, 
and it has this huge effect with the prototypes we already have developed uh, on, on the acceptance and willingness of many learners, etc. So we should work on smart design. Intelligent, we don't need those intelligent. We want our learners to become intelligent, but our technology should be smart. Um, last point, I'm sorry for the five minutes delay. Um, the last point is, well, that's easy to say, sustainable. Uh, what I, simply what I see is we have been building uh, technologies for 30 years now. We have been uh, writing and developing learning content for, lear for language learning and for other disciplines. And what we see is all these all the software, Hello, but not only the software, but also the concept, the methods behind it, Hello, the, the routines, the, 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 the content we have for... Oh. Okay, well, then, so I finish here. Um, Please lower down the volume of yeah. Either... Um, is, does do many people have the microphones? My microphone has been switched off. So I, I will. Uh, okay. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm talking too loud in all, in all my enthusiasm. Uh, I'm lower. Okay. Now it's it's a little now it's a little lower, isn't it? Okay. Let's finish here. Um. What did I do? generic content structure and generic object models for technology so that we can reuse them again. And if you combine that with an open approach saying, yes, why are we working together on uh, resources, content and technology? Because we should work in an open way on generic models and content structures. Um, Well, challenges, contextual challenges were are things we have to fight against. Methodological were those we have to make choices. And the epistemological challenges are things we need to know. So, in my last slide, voila, I invite you to attend our 16th International Call Research Conference in Antwerp. And we have two pre-conference activities, our International Masterclass in Education Engineering and the Summer School in Research Design. So sorry, Vance, for the, these five minutes of delay. I tried to stick to my schedule, but I think the system was a little bit slow. So I, I blame the system. OK, if you have any question. Well, gosh, you uh, covered so many points and, and some apparent contradictions. Could I ask, I mean, apparent, by apparent, I know uh, wording is very important. Could you state the inconvenient truth that uh, uh, you're, the, the main, I'm just curious about the wording. What is it that technology do exactly in your view? Because obviously you feel that technology can enrich um, and they, uh, it can enhance this. learning. The word. Uh, well, yeah, that's well. He, he it's at the technology in general. It's you have to see it in. Uh, it's in this. I, I was just trying to, in order to formulate questions, I have to know Joseph's. Uh, main point and and so he's he said that 
uh, at the on the slide where we had a long line of people going toward the uh, the very popular approach and people who didn't want to know the inconvenient truth. What was and he said at that point that that was his main message and. Uh, I think I might have misunderstood that. So, well, in other words, that's a, a question of there's a wording. What is it that you are saying that technology cannot do? And then once I've got that straight, I can ask questions about what it can do. It's not really about what it can and can do. It's about what people believe that technology can do. Um, people believe false performances of technology easier. It's the reassuring and they are really hesitant and even reluctant to accept the real role and function of technology, certainly in education. And it's my impression when I talk to teachers, parents, colleagues worldwide, I, I'm often very mad uh, or angry with what people still accept as uh, role and function of technology. Let's say, and now the current pressure on teachers that were very good teachers, and suddenly uh, the, the school decides they have some kind of technology, or they feel they have to use some kind of technology, and they just implement whatever technology in the classroom, be it interactive exercises, well, interactive, simple yeah. exercises, and Looks not like, the, uh, of yeah. blackboard. the not connection those, over there must be. But uh, the fact that they then think that it's all yours. okay, they're cool, they're doing blended learning because they are using technology because they have to. This makes me really very angry. Teachers should yeah, know go ahead, please feel free. Oh yeah, he's he's uh, Josephina is saying everything is frozen for Josephina. Of course, well, I can hear this Vance. demands from please teachers. Please feel free to add your questions. Uh, in, in doing well, I, keep, that I see. I see that um, he's probably work, refreshing the page, and he'll be back. To apply a um, real design effort in their context. I was kind of surprised by the talk. From there to see what the um, role of technology on the one hand, on the other hand, it got me there thinking about no a lot of things. Value, no technology. You can't say in particular nor about wiki, nor what any he just said now. What know, people, what we think that, what we think we should this. think, and I think that's I probably the key. It, it's like fashion. You know, everybody I goes with it because it's fashionable. So let's do it too. It's fashionable. Vance, I don't think you and I are there, and I'm sure a lot of the participants are Aren't either, but think of all the people that use technology or talk about technology as if they actually use it when they don't, and yet they're talking about it because it's the thing to do. Um, so maybe that's where we have to be careful when we talk about technology. How many of you are using technology in the classroom or you're using computers with your students, whether in the school or whether outside the school, they're using it, smartphones and, and so on? Are you using it? And if you are, how do you feel about it? Okay, good. I'm, okay, I'm glad I asked that. <laughs> people are Especially pointing. Especially since in the okay, last so part of your talk, people you using talked, it. for example, um, about uh, are you writing about it? Are you researching uh, it? You know, what are you uh, doing collaboration, with what you're doing? Collaboration between, are you publishing? Uh, you know, work are trying on this. To work on it seems to me that a lot of people that publish work on, tech, on the use of technology very, are not actually uh, using this it. Is, this leads us to something I call social uh, go media ahead. assisted language learning. I see learning. we've got our speaker back. Uh, that is that Welcome back. What we're doing right now, for example, is learning from each other. We're using technology to enhance an understanding, in our case, about uh, these interesting 12 aspects of Cal, which are, you know, we're, we're able to learn from that and from all the presentations here because we're able, because we use technology to uh, to enable us to come together and learn from each other. And I think that uh, you, you mentioned that technology needs to be smart, there needs to be smart design. It's not just, well, well that's one thing that uh, that small idea enables people to come together and learn from one another. But then there's also, as you said, the system is can sense uh, what learners are doing. There, there are analytics that can find out more, uh, you know, can, can it adjust to the learner as uh, as they're using technology, certain technologies. Uh, for example, we uh, boxes and things like that that, that will uh, respond to uh, gesture and, and stuff like that. And, and I suppose Google Glass, you mentioned that also must have some incredible uh, implications for uh, how how uh, how smart technology can enhance learning. 
So that, I, I might have covered a couple of different things in that, uh, in what I just noted. But anyway, um, do you have something to say to that? Maybe that wasn't a good question. Um, um, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> If I, make sure that, I if I make that a question, what kind of uh, what enhancements do you see? What do you think are the most important enhancements to that that technology uh, is doing for us now? How what what are some of the smart technologies that you think uh, help transdisciplinary learning amongst colleagues or? Um, that have great potentials for language learners? Um, uh, but this is a, you know, a very personal um, thing. Is still, I repeat, that personalization and contextualization combined, uh, that makes the intelligence or smartness of, of a system meaning smart. Uh oh, what is frozen? Is my voice frozen? Um, are, do you have questions also, or do, can other people ask questions, make comments? Excellent point, and I totally agree with that. Yeah, that 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 is true of anything you do um, as a teacher. You know, you you do have to explain, if not to the students, of course, but to yourself. Why are you doing what you're doing? What do you hope to accomplish? Uh, what are your goals as Action a teacher? Books. And then, of course, you check and make to make sure that you use the right tool to get to where you wanted to. And if your students were happy with it, and if it brought them to where they wanted to, and that's where I like the idea of your goals, not as a teacher, but also student goals. What are your goals? What do you hope to gain uh, from and, from whatever Christina, course you're taking? Where do you want to go? Now I despise. She said she doesn't know yes. if she can teach without technology. But of course, yeah. that's actually what Joseph was saying earlier at the first was that it doesn't really require technology to teach, but I, and you, quali you qualified that as you carry through your talk, that it needs to be smart, used smartly. But I, I'm sure that Anna Christina didn't mean exactly that, that she can't teach without technology. Surely she could if technology stopped, she would be a great teacher. But uh, what about that? Do we need technology to, uh, st students certainly expect us to use technology. Uh, what's the it's it's why it's, we, it's certainly we, we we can we can teach and can learn without technology we've, we've always done it the only thing is that we can do things faster cheaper and more efficiently with technology and what is the most beautiful part of technology if it increases facilitates yes certainly uh, but if it increases the role the added value of the teacher that's what i mean mean with the I, I i do not agree with the word flipped classroom because it's like oh i have to switch activities no but if you design your learning environment you will automatically see that you'd rather put all the 
exercises on vocabulary and grammar that you leave that to the computer so that the teacher gets more time in the classroom for uh, intercultural communication, etc., etc., etc. This is uh, a very beautiful role of technology. Um, I don't know if I, when I came back, if I, when I, if I heard a question about a publication on this, this again is this pressure on publishing. I've been writing one article on the psychological aspect two years ago, and I'm working now on educational engineering, organizing a master class, and I'm still working on the empirical and theoretical uh, uh, of this model. Uh, it will be a book. I'm starting to write it with Glenn Stockwell in August this year. Well, well Lance, uh, we have to uh, stop. finish it, let's Sorry. say. Yeah, and, um, I'd like to thank. Yes, we do. Also, a series do, of articles, uh, but next which fit in the slow research uh, it approach. Should be really interesting. Meaning, I think it's going to continue uh, the ideas uh, here. It's by two to professors have it who have been teaching online. Everywhere. They and it will teach be the online at various universities in the United States, uh, and it'll be interesting to hear their perspective because teaching online uh, is definitely using possible. technology. Um, so there's no doubt about it. I see it people there. are still uh, discussing. What I'd like you to do, Tom has added a link. Joseph and Vance, um, there's the link I say to where we can continue the discussion. So you can click on that. So In addition, you might want to copy chat, to which I think will appear there as well, so that you can get some of the uh, same questions and, co the and um, choice of comments. Our uh, teaching model, the choice of the so, learning model, thank you, the choice thank you of so much, our evaluation uh, everyone, model, the thank choice you, of Anna. our comp. Thank you for your we kind words. We have to design and, and making choices um, of technology. Stay with us. Uh, teaching model, learning model, evaluation model, And see model, where contents, this goes. This is an ongoing discussion, media. of course. Everything we have to choose um, thank you, Vance. And put place. This thank is you, design Professor and we have Joseph. to do that in a methodological uh, and identifiable way. And then from the Belgium. role of technology, and believe from, it or um, not, is only the last phase. It's only the logical conclusion of a design Bye -bye. exercise. And the only thing what people have to say, whether they use technologies or not, they need they need a good reasoning to do it or not to do it. And this is what we can